I'm Joe Grangs. I'm a faculty member in urban planning at the College of Architecture and Urban Planning here at the University of Michigan. Um, I do research on transportation policy, uh, racial segregation, and geographic patterns of poverty. And so I, I use geographic information systems a lot. I teach GIS and I use it in my research. For those of you who don't know what GIS is yet, you'll probably learn what it is very soon. It's just about everywhere these days, but it's basically, it's a, it's a way of combining geographic locations with databases so that you can answer questions about data. Um, so now we're here for what we're calling a conversation. So uh, that's meant to stress a free flow of ideas. It's not really about necessarily following up on uh, topics that the speakers raised. Um, but it's meant to spark a creative response and get you talking, perhaps even with one another, if you would. Let me just tell you a little bit about what this topic is meant to be about. We call it technology of empowerment, and that word empowerment, I hope, suggests people. So there's an interface between people and these technologies that we've been talking about, and it also suggests, hopefully, um, differences in power among people as they interact with these technologies. And it's motivated by the question, are recent technologies breaking down barriers between people? So for instance, perhaps new technologies can help us achieve a more just society. Technologies like free online neighborhood indicators or web-based GIS or 3D simulations that help people work through collective problems uh, these are all meant to elicit a more meaningful participation from people who would otherwise opt out or be marginalized in decision making. And they also offer the potential for otherwise marginalized people to challenge the shortcomings of government programs. I'll give you a quick example of this, by the way. When I was a doctoral student in upstate New York, uh, I was working with a community development group in Rochester, uh, and they were really excited about getting GIS. And I asked them, so why is it so important to get GIS? And they said, well, now the city can't <clears throat> F with us. Um, so um, it, it meant a lot to them for fighting for their neighborhood. But on the other hand, now these new technologies can promote um, uh, a more grassroots approach to the design process. So in the creative collaborative processes between designers and um, and users, as we've seen in many of the presentations today. Yet other aspects of these very same technologies threaten to undermine the breaking down of these barriers that I'm talking about. Softwares are complex, costs are high, digital information privileges certain kinds of knowledge, and um, we have um, a sort of a positivist approach to understanding the world. So, um, Ultimately, we're wondering where are we headed with regard to the potential for information technologies to deliver on empowering a more engaged, active citizenry and a more inclusive, collaborative design of the spaces we use and the places we inhabit. So let me get started then with, um, with I, I'd, I'd like to take slightly a different approach here now. We've so far been talking about your ideas and your beliefs and your thoughts about this stuff. Now I'd like you to reflect a little bit on your practice, the things that you actually do. Even though we come from different disciplines, all of us do something each day. We teach students, we uh, work with clients, etc. Could you reflect a little bit on the things that you do um, um, to counteract the ways that technology might contribute to either bringing people together or pulling them apart? I'll give you a quick example. I said I work in, with GIS. And part of my brain knows that the people that I'm studying are complex creatures with very, um, very messy identities. And yet, the data that I'm working with in GIS has very simple census categories of variables. And people are represented as dots on the screen. And frankly, I get sucked into a positivist way of understanding my world. Um, how about you in the work that you do and the way that you interface technology? <laughs> I can start. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, for me, uh, it, it's really important to spend time in, in with the developing world partners that we create these wheelchairs with. Um, it takes uh, it takes a lot of time to build the trust where they can uh, where we can honestly and freely exchange ideas. Um, a lot of these people we work with, uh, I think, come from a culture where they should be appreciative if someone's giving you something. And you, you know, I, I see countless pictures of people with their brand new wheelchair that I know is going to break in a month, but they've got the big smile on their face, and and, and you know, you need to take the pretty picture for the donor so the donor feels good. And you need to break that down and, and really, you know, ask them, what do you think's bad about the design? And maybe they'll be kind of soft about giving you an answer. And then a few minutes later, ask, no, really, what's bad about the design? And, and so for me, it's really important to, to break down those barriers by, by being there, building that relationship, doing design reviews side by side, you know, really pulling our, our ideas and ingenuity together. And I think that's what makes it work. Well, I'll um, sort of be second. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question, you know, how do you interface, I guess, with client, with community? And in my practice, uh, as well as in teaching, one of the things that um, I, I guess I really advocate is that we, we get out of the studio, you know? And, you know, I think some of these tools are really fantastic to communicate to communities, particularly giving them more information. But at the end of the day, I think there's nothing better than kind of being with the people that you're designing for and actually trying to understand the idiosyncrasies of their life. Uh, we just finished a project in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1,000 acres, and our final project, our final presentation was not the set of drawings that we made, but we actually took people out in the community and actually walked them around and had them kind of envision the designs that we were taking. So we weren't looking at any of the tools that we used. And it was interesting, based on a six-month process, they had a very clear idea of what they wanted and what they didn't want. And they would not say that in the public meeting, but they would say it on the street corner. They would say it in the park. They would say, we don't want it here. And this kind of feedback loop, I think, for us, it's a way to somehow validate, but at times, you know, get you out of this kind of singular way of thinking about your work. So. Yeah, I, I could uh, reflect on that a bit. Um, I think uh, for for me in my own practice, and so, and 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 often I see this in other people's practices as well. Maybe per particularly in the field of kind of technology development. So we're in the midst of this amazing time when technology is moving so fast and its impact on society is, is really profound and, and that's, you know, we're seeing so many changes and, and, and um, a lot of them are very positive and I'm very excited about. So, um, you know, the fact that there are these technologies that are empowering people to create media, to, to create content, to create technologies, um, it's really exciting, and we can be um, excited about all of the positive potentials of those spaces. Um, I, I find um, myself, and again, the, the communities that I'm part of, uh, doesn't often enough step back and reflect on the negative implications or potential negative implications of some of this technology. Um, I think part of technology culture that's wonderful is that we tend to be kind of exuberant and engaged in what we're doing. Um, a, a less wonderful kind of parallel to that is we tend to, to be not so self-critical or introspective about the systems that we're building. And so I think it's important for me to kind of consciously make time to reflect on um, the negative potentials of things. I've been really actually enjoying uh, Nicholas Carr's writing recently, kind of along some of these dimensions. But as, as an academic, uh, I, I think there are, th there are three ways in which, which, which I've tried to participate in, and intervene in these processes. One has been in the academic domain, and that has meant um, engaging in conversations with, with people who approach these technologies from a more mainstream perspective and a more 
sort of values, presum presumptions of, of value, freedom, and ob objectivity, and, and, and find ways to have productive conversations where each side learns from the other. And that's actually been a fairly successful process in my discipline. We've seen some very interesting cross-fertilization over the last 15 years between the software developers and the GIS researchers, as they used to be known, and, 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 the, and people um, looking at these issues from, from a more sort of critical and, 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 and emancipatory perspective. The second domain which we should never underestimate is, is teaching, right? And, and, and here it's a con considerable degree about trying to encourage students to recognize and, and reconsider the presuppositions with which they approach a problem, not trying to dictate an answer, but trying to get people to, to at least think again about what they always, how they always believed things are supposed to be. And then the third level has been working in low-income communities in a, a deeply participatory mode, really trying to involve members of the community fully in the research so, so that their um, perspectives, their initiatives, their priorities become more, at least as important as those that we might be bringing to the project. As I've said in my talk, it's a very difficult process to do. It's not only difficult because you're already approaching this from the very differently empowered positions, the academic versus the community members. The communities themselves are incredibly diverse places, divided along all kinds of lines of occupation and gender and class and race and, and geographic location. And, and so involving them in discussions which will allow people to feel like they're making a difference without or having to come to a consensus remains an ongoing challenge. I just wanted to add that um, in terms of the um, in in terms of the pedagogical model of um, maybe in, in the conversation of, of interdisciplinary um, approaches to um, some of these projects, um, there there is a a huge challenge in terms of. Um, linking up or, or aligning the different kind of discourse that's happening in different, um, in different disciplines that bringing those together, I think, around a particular project um, that's, that's more in a, in a laboratory setting that has particular parameters allows for that kind of um, perhaps a new language to develop between, between the disciplines. Um, it's, I find it um, challenging to actually breach um, the divides between faculties um, and that are so necessary to these kinds of experiments in terms of bringing engineers on board and bringing the biologists on board and, and aligning um, as well the, the courses and the students that are affiliated with those, um, with, with those disciplines. Um, and so, to me, that's, that's a, um, something that is absolutely necessary in order to crack a lot of these problems is to bring the, um, the expertise that's associated with different disciplines together and how to do so within, um, within an academic uh, setting is, is, um, is a big challenge. Yeah, I, um, um, I think it's a big world. And um, I think there are a number of different ways of doing this, and I think we've seen a wide range of, of making this kind of address. And I'd just like to offer that we often equate empowerment with a, an explicit social agenda. And um, as someone who is very thankful that he did not go after Amos, <laughs> you know, championing uh, a BMW Velt after Amos's <laughs> presentation would have been problematic, to say the least. <laughs> uh, um, but, um, and I'm someone who, I do a lot of things, but I think one of the things that I enjoy best is to write. And what I try to do when I write is to show the ways in which the physical environment <coughs> changes sensibility, regardless of a social agenda, although I think that is implicit within it. But I think one of the things that architecture and landscape architecture and all design disciplines do is something that perhaps is not at first 
socially explicit, but finally is profoundly socially explicit insofar as it changes the way we literally see the world. And I think that's one of the things, the only thing, but certainly one of the things that all of these arts have to offer us. I just wanted to add, to build on that though, I mean, yeah. what's, I guess what's really difficult within the practice of environmental design is how do you create, um, how do you set up this broadness in your practice? And one of the things for me, trying to craft a practice that can deal with social agendas on one hand, but can also be free, right, yeah. to, to sort of create and move forward. And I think that's one of the great things of just sitting here and listening to this panel today. It's one of the things that, you know, I constantly sort of strive for, you know, to have this kind of generosity on one hand, but also this commitment on the other hand to uh, your profession, the thing that you do. Because historically, I mean, we know in the 20th century, particularly in this country, architecture, environmental design, the social agenda of this country mid-century, it really did destroy a lot of individuals and practices, you know, and, and really kind of put certain people, um, well, to be quite frank, it mm -hmm. put people of color, people who were, had been marginalized, who came into these environmental design fields, it said to them, you're the only ones who are gonna do this, you know, and so you get marginalized within the profession. And, you know, and I think now we have this opportunity to move past that, but we have a whole generation of people who I think had a voice who basically were marginalized because you know, the rest of the world said, you deal with those problems. And now I think through this kind of more interdisciplinary problem solving, through more information being out there, I think you can, do, you can, you can at least put yourself in the context where you can make those decisions and move from one in context to the other. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that's one of the things that's coming it's really nice to see that reinforced through the various um, commitments here yeah. at the table. Well, a, a lot of things have come up today that um, might cause us to be fearful, um, or, or I'm sorry, hopeful, for, <laughs> <laughs> hopeful for um, the future and bringing people together. But now I'd like to ask, you know, what, what, is, what aspects of these technologies we're talking about make you most fearful, the, the aspects that uh, may serve to separate and drive people apart. Well, I would start with the fetish of the thing, you know, I was talking about the thing and what I mean by that, kind of the fetish <laughs> of being able to make, you know, to do something different mm -hmm. and, um, and really getting sidetracked and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really fearful of that within the profession of environmental design, that we have the ability to deal with a wide range of issues through our work, but there's something about that thing that we get so attracted to that thing. And I hope you guys understand what I mean by the thing, right? I mean, it's, you know, I got that new CNC, I got that router, man, and I'm back there making form, you know, but Bernini, you know, he did exist at one point in time. So, I mean, there's this, Ability, how do you move from that kind of the fetish to the world? And, and that, you know, I struggle with that. I struggle with that in the environmental design um, profession as well as in academia, as well as, you know, just in general. And I think for me, that, that's very scary to me because there are bigger issues. Go ahead. Uh, I, I try to maintain a healthy fear of. Uh, latching on to my own idea as like a great idea. Um, and, it, and it goes back to that interaction with uh, other people, you know, stakeholders in, in the field. But like, you know, with our wheelchair, this is like the fifth prototype we're on. And, and everyone before it, you know, we design it, we ride it, and we're like, yeah, this is awesome. And, and we bring it to Africa, and they're like, this is terrible. <laughs> and, and I think it's, it's good to be grounded like that every once in a while. And I, I really try to keep that... I don't want to call it a fear because I, I think it's a healthy part of design, but I, I really try to keep it prominent in my mind and not latch on to an idea that it's like the best idea 
And I think, especially when you're collaborating, not latch on to your own idea. Always try to seek the best idea. You know, I, when I'm teaching, I, I try to convey it as egoless engineering. You know, because if, if your buddy has the best idea, you know, go after that. Don't, don't hold on to yours and, and try to only promote your own ideas. I, I, get, I guess one, one thing which I really worry about is, is the question of access. By that, I don't simply mean, like, the digital divide. Some people have access and others don't. But I mean access, decision-making, the opportunity to develop technologies in ways that are appropriate for various kinds of communities, um, access to um, places where cutting-edge technologies are, are being developed. I, I, I was struck in, in your work about how these are wonderful projects, but they're in kind of elite spaces. And, and so how can we take that innovation and move it into other communities? And I, I think more, more generally trying to connect across the talks this afternoon, it'll be interesting to have a discussion at some point about the relationship between the issue of environmental and ecological sustainability and, and social justice and social sustainability. Because we've kind of talked about those as if they're separate dimensions of the issue, but in fact, they're really closely and complexly interrelated. Um, I would say um, that my greatest fear, um, or, or the thing that worries me, I, I think, about technology is um, what drives the technology, the, the ideology or the, the um, politics behind uh, technological advancement. Because most of the time, technology is, is, um, has an influx of, of capital that's, that's, um, that comes from, from things like military, um, et cetera, that uh, drive its, its development and, 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 and its trajectory. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, in, in a other context uh, of my studies in terms of water management, um, technologies such as uh, desalination and, and, um, and reverse osmosis, things that are, that are actually, you know, championed in, in certain uh, climates, especially arid climates, uh, become so prevalent and this kind of this, um, this uh, overall panacea to a larger regional problem um, that sometimes precludes a, a, a shift in the thinking of, of a much more comprehensive and integrated management uh, in terms of water resources, so attaching this kind of um, mechanical or technological solution to a problem that is a lot more complex, that could have a lot more diversification in terms of its solutions, um, what some term soft solutions rather than hard solutions. Um, and so the, the questioning of sort of what drives the technology for it to, to um, to proliferate and um, and perpetuate certain um, actions. So, I, I'm not a big worrier. Um, <laughs> I have to say, <laughs> um, I'm just just not. Um, and <laughs> but sometimes it does concern me that um, a population such as ours, which enjoys so many luxuries. I mean, my God, you think about it. We hit the jackpot. You think of any other time or any other place that you could have been born, we lucked out big time. So if there's one thing that does concern me, it doesn't really worry me, it concerns me, is that sometimes we don't realize that. And we don't realize how much we do have accessible to us, how many tools are available to us, how many resources are available to us, and you know how much we really can affect the world. Yeah, uh, a uh, concern I have, I guess, about the uh, the current technological landscape that we're living in is uh, there's this wonderful new ability we have to personalize everything so I can uh, uh, 
uh, personalized now objects. We talked a lot about that today. Um, new technologies that let us um, have exactly kind of the objects that we want or the environment that we want. Um, technologies like uh, Amazon or, or helping us have our own personal, really kind of wonderful, tailored uh, uh, bookstore, kind of just for my interests and uh, my kind of perspective. Um, uh, communication technologies are creating these kind of personalized communities so I can now connect with people around the world that, that share my interests and passions and create these kind of niche communities. And that's really wonderful in, in many, many ways but I, I worry about um, the kind of stratification of society that, that, that some of this uh, implies. And I think we're starting to see some of this in, for example, the current political discourse in the country and just how, um, how you get the sense that everyone is kind of living in their own kind of personalized uh, political reality and there's not a lot of uh, shared experience or kind of shared uh, media or really shared culture anymore and that that is uh, problematic in, in a lot of ways. As our speakers make their way back to their seats, could we give them a big hand? <laughs> 